Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Well, there's an idiom that goes, give someone enough rope and he'll hang himself. I suppose the same is true with dope. Give someone enough dope and if they don't hang themselves, they'll shoot themselves in the foot until they don't have a leg to stand on. And isn't that what has happened here in this interview done by the interview room? It was actually conducted on August the 1st and it is 100 minutes long. I'll put a link to that in the description. I think the most extraordinary thing about Don cooking his own goose is just how well he cooked it. In that conversation with Chris McDonough from August 1st, which feels like April 1st, doesn't it? April Fools. Um, he, he does even most of the talking. During those 100 minutes, Don does most of the talking. And they also say loose lips sink ships. And Don's lips were playing fast and loose. They have been for a while. Uh, he's also been very communicative on Facebook. Um, And so what this is, is a goose that's not only cooked, but toast and uh, going down with the ship. It's a cooked goose that's become toast and it's going down with the ship. And I think Don's going down with it and and so is everybody else. By the way, Grandma, if you have some kind of immunity idol you want to play and if you want to say something, now might be the time to do so. If anybody has a hidden immunity idol and you want to play it, now would be the time to do so. Before I get started, I want to credit Chris McDonough and the interview room for doing a masterful job, not only in the interview, but also providing the transcript. I liked how he kept bringing the narrative back to the events of June 15th. As a result, we found out a lot more about what happened, and in my opinion, it's very, very incriminating especially in terms of the timeline, Don is in serious trouble. At one point, he did address the possibility of an accident, saying effectively, did Grandma do something? It reminded me of Tammy Lee saying, did Shanann do something to Chris Watts? It's an effective ploy because there's no love lost apparently between Grandma and Don. Grandma doesn't think Don's good enough for Candace. Uh, She's disliked him from the beginning. I think Don's hated her guts ever since she was the reason, I think he said, that he was arrested. And I'm not sure if he had to serve 10 years or he could have gotten 10 years, but um, I think he felt that she was to blame for that. Not that he committed any kind of crime, but that she, um, you know, informed on him kind of thing. So there's no love lost between the two. And if Don wants to get some payback, did grandma do something presents him with an opportunity to do so. In this episode, we're going to go through eight of the biggest bombshells from Don's titanic um, call, his titanic moment. Uh, These are eight times he shoots himself in the foot. Shooting yourself once in the foot, you'd think, is sufficient, but Don does it over and over and over again. I'll be following this up with a live, detailing a few adjustments to my working theory. I must also say... I personally expect to see an arrest or two very soon. And I'll say more about that in the next live. So before we get started, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment and let's get started. So the first bombshell, the phone records have been magically deleted. And that word magically is actually from Don himself, if you want to Listen to it, um, the exact um, words and context, then then head to 13 minutes, 23 seconds into the the video on the interview room. As I say, the link is in the description. But what Don says is, um, I thought it was 5.30, but the strange thing of it is that we went to the Hawkins County to do our lie detectors and everything like that. They took all of our phones and then magically... All of our phone records from 3.30 on that day have been deleted. Uh, at another point, um, Chris McDonough asks, when did they give them back to you? Meaning, when did you get your phones back? And Donwell says, uh, they gave them back, you know, fairly quickly. But we never even looked at until about, you know, a week or two ago. We, was, we have some detectives that we talked to a lot and they wanted to know exactly this information. And we all looked and it was gone. It was all gone, deleted. 
Um, I don't know. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he wouldn't have looked at that information? Um, I don't. I, I, I have a friend who, um, who, who died in the Himalayas, and I've actually often gone to look at the last communications we had. So I, I just find that very unlikely. Um, both from a perspective of innocence and and um, and not necessarily innocence. The phone records, um, you know, even if you were an innocent person, you might say, "Well, I wonder if this can't prove it," and and otherwise, right? The phone records, Don's, Candace's, and Grandma's have all been deleted since 3:30 p.m. on June 15th. I've been saying all along that the answer is time, but it's also the most important question. Don blames the cops for losing their phone records. I, I don't know how stupid does he think we are. Um, I don't think that has happened. What's from, and I think there is the possibility that they deleted it and gave it back to them. I think that's possible. I don't know whether that is protocol for law enforcement. I would imagine that is... Um, deleting or destroying evidence um, but p perhaps when you transfer it through the uh, some of these processes um, perhaps that can happen I don't know um, but uh, it seems like Don is saying that the cops wiped out this essential part of the timeline from all three of their phones um, another possibility is that Don uh, Candace and gr Grandma cooperating ge in getting rid of their own phone data. Perhaps Don cracked the whip and the others had to do what he said or else. Of course, from 3.30 onwards is precisely the part of the timeline we're particularly interested in. Don also says he thinks he called Candace at 3 p.m. and she was either at Walgreens or on the way to the swimming hole. Now, my impression from Candace was that Don called her quite early, sometime in the morning. And this is what Candace said to Chris McDonough, that Don called her quite early. Um, remember, Macbeth was also there when Don called, and Macbeth also told, I think, um, Chris, I'm not sure if Macbeth told the interview room this, but we do know that Macbeth was dropped off at around 2 p.m. So if Macbeth overheard the call, and according to Macbeth, the call was around, uh, the, you know, the beginning of the excursion, not the end. And it does feel a bit like the morning, doesn't it? Which means Don's um, memory of that call is is off by, it feels like quite a large margin, unless there were multiple calls. If the cops did delete the call records, then that's great because it means they have it. I'm not sure if Don's trying to suggest that the cops accidentally wiped their phones and that the data is lost. And um, maybe Don himself doesn't know. What do you guys think? But I do suspect this is the tip of the iceberg in what I suspect is not only a cover-up, but a conspiracy to cover up. Anyone who is part of that conspiracy, if you're listening to this, you might want to put up your hand now, given the pace that things are unfolding, and also just how much Don has sold the farm already. If anybody has the hidden immunity idol and feels they need to play it, now is the time to do so. If uh, drug addicts are the world's best liars, they're also master artists at covering up, master manipulators, because that's something else they're doing all the time. But even the best liars need to know when to shut up. And I think in this case, Chris McDonough gave Don plenty of rope, if you get my drift. And, jo and Don just did the rest. So... Are the phone records lost? Not likely. On the other hand, given that 51 days have passed since Summer's disappearance, maybe law enforcement need more to work with. Maybe they're hoping or counting on someone eventually coming forward. That brings us to point number two. Don describes the last time he saw Summer. And that happens at 20 minutes 43 seconds. And there Don describes Summer as being, quote, asleep by his side when he woke up, end quote. He said he woke up on June the 15th at about 7. Bear in mind, Candace said something about, um, I think, dressing Summer at 8 because it was a hot day, I think in a bathing suit or something like that. So the, uh, the relevant part of the transcript goes 
Don Will says, and we've tried and tried to make her sleep in her own bed, and she'd come to me with big tears in her eyes and say, but Daddy, I want to sleep with you. I want to be with you. I couldn't say no. I just couldn't. And I can't help thinking of those words. I couldn't say no. I just couldn't. Um, having to do with something else, like low impulse control, dealing in a given, given um, the situation with all these substances, it actually raises quite a lot of troubling um, thoughts, doesn't it? Um, Chris McDonough pertinently asks Don, you know, how long has she been doing that? In other words, sleeping in the bed with him, and, and Don says five years. In other words, the whole time, all her life, every night. Number three, Don admitted he didn't tell law enforcement he thought Summer was abducted. That's on the night of June 15th. I've kind of been saying that from the beginning that, you know, if he was so convinced it was an abduction, then he would have said so from the get go. He would have said so in the first interviews. He would have been, there would have been more urgency and conviction. Also, law enforcement would have echoed his sentiments. In any event, you can listen to Don uh, saying something to that effect at 11 minutes, 13 seconds into the transcript. Then the fourth point, Don drove to the shed at the bottom by the power lines when he arrived. That is referred to at 26 minutes, 37 seconds. And why that is so important is that he doesn't do what a normal, reasonable person would do, which is some is, some is missing. Why on earth would you go to a shed? Um, why would you not go to the house? And I think that is an important question, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit in the live um, later today. Then, and holding hands with number four is number five. Uh, so Don drives to the shed at the bottom. This is not kind of on the property. It's actually much lower where the power lines are, right? So it's a shed that has road access, right? Um so Don drives to that shed, that's point number four, but point number five is Don forgets to look in the shed. And that is addressed at approximately 27 minutes. So think about what we're talking about. Don is racing home to find his daughter, right? It's kind of an emergency. And then he goes to the first place he goes is to the shed, but then he doesn't go in. Don doesn't go to the house, he goes to the shed, but forgets to look for Summer inside it. And I think it's at 22 minutes 45 into the transcript. So it's a little bit further than that because Chris started speaking before that. But it's at that point that Chris says, okay, when did you go into that shed? Uh, sorry, he says, and then did you go into that shed? And Don says, no. Chris says, is that yours too? Is that your shed? And Don says, yeah, it is mine. And then he said, um, you know what? I, I actually don't know if I did go in there and look in there. I'm not sure when, if it was right then or another time. So he's sort of saying, you know what? I may have gone in there, but, but I don't know if I went in there then. So what on earth is he saying? He, he raced back to the, the property, went to the shed, but then didn't look inside it. And surely if he did look inside it, he would remember. Surely if he didn't look inside it, he would remember. Incidentally, he also forgets to look at the door where she could have been abducted from or wandered out of that's in the house. Uh, Chris has actually got to direct his attention to it, otherwise he wouldn't have mentioned it. So, so Don says, I looked everywhere. Chris uh, says, this is at 26.34 in the transcript, says, and what about the door, meaning the basement door? And Don Wells answers, no, I don't remember. I do know that the boys, we cuss them because they leave it wide open all the time. And so I think there's been this talk about the door being locked, the door not being locked, the door being locked, the door not being locked. So anyway, that brings us to point number six. Don left the property by car shortly after arriving. Now, we, we know that from Candace as well, that Candace um, also said that she raced around in her vehicle at some point. But so we have Don leaving the property by car, um, according to him. And that is referenced at 28 minutes, 14 seconds in the video. So um, the interesting thing is the police arrive 
Don wants to leave and he wants to investigate the drug dealers. He isn't sort of want to sort of hand it over to the police and say, look, uh, you need to look into this person. You need to go and chase up that lead. He wants to go and investigate kind of on his own, not take anyone with him, no explanation. He wants to kind of get going. And so in terms of the transcript, it's time stamped 2336. Don Wells says, once the police started arriving um, and everything, I was like, man, I'm going to go question all these damn drug dealers and everything like that. And then Chris, he speaks quite a lot. And then Chris just says, why would you do that? And then he goes into quite a lot of detail about the activities taking place there. And that brings us to point number seven. I'm not going to go into it into too much detail. Um, it is basically Don throwing an unnamed co-worker under the bus, um, kind of implicating him. It sort of starts at about 14 minutes, 27 seconds into the video. Don says, he's my first suspect and still is. And a lot of the... Um, of, of the 100 minutes is sort of chewed up talking about this guy. Uh, I think he drives a yellow vehicle and this and that and the next thing. But what is, in, in summary, what, what Don is actually doing is he's using the classic John Benet Ramsey motive in his story, which is that a disgruntled co-worker, thirsty for revenge, took somewhere in order to get back at Don, right? Well, if that were the case, why not say that from the outset? Why, if it's so obvious... Why wouldn't you be saying it and repeating it all along? Why not say that every time he was interviewed or on social media? Why are you also protecting this person who's, who's so out to get you? Why wouldn't you just provide his name? Why? And, and, and the other side of it is, it, wouldn't it be easy just to, to say the person's name, go to his house, and then either exclude that person or, um, or find Summer? The other thing that I think is quite ironic is Don describes his prime suspect as a, quote, sicko hillbilly druggy. But isn't that also a description of Don? So ultimately, he doesn't throw grandma under the bus. Perhaps he needs her. Perhaps he still needs her. And so far, grandma's maintaining her silence. She hasn't said anything on her Facebook page since the 12th of July. So, you know, that's, it's almost a month that has gone by with grandma saying nothing on social media. That brings us to the eighth and final point. Ben Hill Road is a drug corridor. That's something that he admits. And Don used to run dope into Mexico. Now, I suppose you could say out of Mexico, but basically admits that he was, um, uh, what's the word? transporting uh, substances of some kind, dope, I guess, into or out of Mexico. That's also addressed at 29 minutes, 22 seconds in the video. I'm not sure if Benil Road is a drug corridor or if it's a thoroughfare up to the Well Chalet. You know, like the way that he's saying is like, well, we these innocent people that just happen to live uh, next to a drug corridor and, and you know, they bad, we good, and, and, you know, something like that. I'm not sure if that's the case or if that drug corridor actually curls up the hill and, and sort of terminates at the Well Chalet. Um, someone described the Well Chalet, certainly as they saw it, as they saw the inside of it, as a meth house. Well, wasn't it? There's a lot more to unpack from the 100 minutes. I don't really want to spend more than about 20 minutes doing that right now. We've looked at statements, but one can also do statement and voice analysis. There's a fascinating but troubling area in the transcript where Don complains about mud and dirt being everywhere, speaking, I think, of June 15th. What I will say at this point is what I've said from the beginning. We can see excesses at work here. The only question is how extreme are these excesses? That we're talking about and unsurprisingly the excesses are extreme and constant they habitual and none of that bodes well for summer or for those closest to her engaging habitually in these activities so back to the idiom give someone enough rope and he'll hang himself do you think that has happened here do you think that has also happened with the dope give someone enough dope and they'll hang themselves 
Do you think Don still has a foot to stand on? Do you think Don has shot himself in the foot? If he has, what do you think law enforcement are still waiting for? So I'm not going to take it further than that. Uh, I am going to be doing a live stream later this evening. I'll let you guys know more about that in the... Uh, I'll, I'll put a something on Twitter or possibly make an announcement on YouTube in the community tab. So keep your eyes on that. So if you in the USA, it'll probably be sort of late afternoon when you are kind of arriving home. In any event, thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.